Thank you for inviting me to speak at this meeting. For the next 15 minutes, I aim to demonstrate how the HIV clinic in Brighton changed and adapted during COVID-19, but specifically to outline the role of the nurse in this regard. To give it some context, the HIV clinic in Brighton has 2,400 patients, the majority of which are men who have sex with men. In terms of age, we have one of the oldest cohorts in the UK, and so have a high profile of people with comorbidities. We also have higher than average problems with mental health and substance misuse amongst our caseload. The picture here is a picture of our Royal Pavilion, which is illuminated with the colors of the rainbow flag. And just to reassure you that this is before any social distancing. In terms of nurse-led activities and servitors, there are blood test appointments, there's telephone and face-to-face -face nurse triage for which the nurses undertake a competency-based assessment. We undertake annual health checks, mental health screening and suicide assessment. We have a nursing service for engagement and care. We undertake nursing assessments and referral on to other services. Newfield clinics, specialist nurse clinics, including for patients who have hepatitis C co-infection, case management for patients with complex needs, and all of the clinic nurses have a named nurse caseload for patients who are deemed to have increased needs, such as new patients, patients with mental health problems, homelessness, or multiple comorbidities. Many of you will be familiar with the World Health Organization's timeline for the COVID-19 response. And on the 30th of January, the Director General declared the novel coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. At that time, we developed COVID-19 pathways for the HIV clinic in Brighton. And this was based on Public Health England guidance and also guided by primary care pathways. And this included screening people at reception and screening people who were booking appointments. It also included assessing patients who presented in the clinic with the key symptoms of coronavirus at that time. We made sure that we were familiar with the pathways to our health protection team and that we had access to PPE in order to carry out these assessments. And as I'm sure that many of you experienced, many patients turned up with symptoms during that time. At this particular time, there was no specific advice for people living with HIV. On the 11th of March, the World Health Organization confirmed coronavirus as a pandemic. On the 12th of March, we identified a draft contingency plan for the clinic, which identified the minimum number of staff required to deliver an essential service. That essential service being antiretroviral therapy, face-to-face -face appointments for urgent cases and bloods, and also maintaining engagement and care. By the 23rd of March, we'd moved our clinic services to virtual stroke telephone consultations with urgent bloods only, canceled joint clinics, posted antiretroviral prescriptions, and then communicated with patients as best we could, often by test text messages with links to websites and information about information that was relevant to them. And towards the end of March, we were getting information from the British HIV Association around shielding and specific guidance for people living with HIV. By the end of March, more than 50% of our nursing team was redeployed uh, to COVID areas. So part of the nursing role was to look at all the people who had booked blood appointments and to triage those who needed urgent blood tests. Um, blood appointments were deferred if people had viral load of less than 40 for more than 18 months, CD4 count of greater than 200 and had stable full blood count using these and LFTs. Patients were advised to keep their appointments if they had abnormal results at the last appointment, specifically around renal and liver dysfunction or hepatitis B monitoring or patients who were on chemotherapy. But I think more importantly was the risk benefit assessment that the nurses undertook in relation to how easy it was for patients to come to the clinic. Could they get by private transport? We discouraged the use of public transport 
and also assessing whether the patient needed to shield either because of their HIV condition or because of other health conditions they may have had. So this is what our nursing activity looked like from January 2020 to September 2020. And if you look first of all at the olive green line, that you can see that in the middle of February, a sharp decrease um, in the number of uh, blood appointments um, and remaining extremely low during April for a period of four to six weeks, then starting to increase just at the beginning or middle of May um, and returning to normal um, eventually uh, by the end of September. And part of this was also driven by the number of staff available, as well as the government guidelines around lockdown and accessing health services. If you also look at the red line, this is HIV nurse triage, and you can see that from the beginning of February, for a period of about six weeks to two months, there was a sharp increase in the number of mostly telephone triages uh, that the nurses were taking. And this was driven largely by people who were complaining of symptoms of COVID or the people who were trying to clarify what the information and advice was for people living with HIV. And you can see that this is tailed off um, to uh, a relatively uh, normal, in fact, below normal level um, uh, for uh, the duration of the year. We started to get um, guidance uh, around uh, the 25th of March from the British HIV Association um, uh, for people living with HIV. And we decided to try and identify patients in our clinic who were at increased risk um, during COVID. So first of all, we uh, did a database search and we found that there were six patients who had a CD4 count of less than 50, who were then giving shielding advice for people who were extremely clinical vulnerable. So uh, the top tier um, uh, for people at risk um, in the UK. We also identified 47 patients who had a CD4 count of less than 200. Um, 69 patients who had a detectable viral load, of which 22 were not on antiretroviral therapy. For those patients, we made sure they had an antiretroviral prescription. We checked when their last appointment was, and if they hadn't had one, they were offered a telephone appointment or, if necessary, a face-to-face -face appointment. And for those who'd had been seen recently, made sure that they had a follow-up appointment in the system, and we were surprised how many people actually didn't have that. This group of patients were given shielding advice for those who were clinically vulnerable, so taking additional precautions um, as, uh, as opposed to those who were extremely clinically vulnerable. For patients who weren't on antiretroviral therapy, we looked to see when they'd last been seen, whether they were engaged with care, um, and if there'd been a recent conversation about them starting antiretroviral therapy. We worked with our community partners and we looked at all the patients who'd been discussed at our community multidisciplinary meeting, therefore those patients who've got increased needs. And we looked at the period uh, from the beginning of January um, to uh, the end of March 2020. And there were 29 patients. And we went through and discussed each patient and reviewed their care plan, looked at whether they were living at home, what their increased needs might be, like for example, mental health, maintaining engagement and care, adherence to antiretroviral therapy. And everyone had a three month care plan uh, developed and was referred on to other services if they were unable to be supported by, or by our community nursing colleagues. We also looked at those patients who were lost to follow up from April 2018 to March 2019, of which there were 22 patients. And we wrote to all of those patients, inviting them to start antiretroviral therapy and explaining the guidelines from BEVA that it believed that patients on antiretroviral therapy may well do better if they contracted COVID than those not on antiretroviral therapy. Interestingly, nobody came forward as a result of those letters. We chose that period specifically because those patients who'd been lost to follow up since April 2019 will have received contact uh, from us in the last year. 
We also looked at our named nurse caseloads. And as said previously, those were for patients who um, have got increased needs, whether they are physical, whether that's mental health, whether that's social care, or whether that's psychosocial. And the reason that we looked at this group was because of an audit we undertook in May 2019 of 116 patients on the named nurse lists. We saw that 7% had not, were not on antiretroviral therapy versus 1% of the general clinic population. 15% had detectable viral load versus 1% in the general clinic population. And 52% of those patients were in the complex care category. In the UK, that's HARS 3 category, which was mostly driven by mental health, being under the care of a psychiatrist and under the care of a social worker. So these were most definitely patients who had identified increased needs. And looking again at that um, bottom row on that table, um, each patient um, had their care reviewed, was given a three-month care plan, sent an ARV prescription, um, sometimes hand-delivered, um, and was given follow-up and then an interim adherence check where indicated on a monthly or six-weekly basis. We worked in a very close collaboration um, with many of our community partners during this time who'd adapted their services to increased telephone support, um, where people had met for lunch on a weekly basis. Um, they were delivered uh, food packages where they needed that, particularly if people found it difficult um, to get out or were shielding. Um, we worked with the St Mungo's homeless teams who housed um, homeless patients in hotels. So for the first time, we were able to identify where our patients were and were able to hand deliver their antiretroviral therapy. And we worked closely with uh, community uh, services in Sussex Community Trust and Sussex Partnership and Terence Higgins Trust, who were providing telephone support for people regarding finance um, and housing issues. In terms of resetting services, the aim was to increase capacity from 20 to 30 percent, initially up to 65 percent by the end of July, so a two month period, and then continuing to increase up until September to reach 100 percent. The current plan is to keep virtual, mostly telephone appointments for um, consultations where this is possible. And there was clear criteria for attending blood appointments. The patients needed to be symptom free or um, uh, uh, living with somebody who was symptom free. Again, discouraging the use of public transport where possible and risk assessing for those attending the clinic as previously. The nursing role also included triaging patients they were seeing for blood appointments um, for their suitability for a telephone doctor appointment or whether they needed to attend for a face-to-face -face medical assessment. Looking at our face-to-face uh, -face versus our virtual consultations, if you look at the blue line from January 2020 up to September, you can see the sharp decline in face-to-face -face appointments and this being replaced by the red line of telephone consultations. The nurses are also undertaking an annual health check cycle. And as many of you will be familiar, uh, this checks people who have multiple physical symptoms, checking mental health, screening for memory problems, um, um, and looking um, at, at other psychosocial issues. This cycle was obviously interrupted um, during a reduction of services. So now all patients attending blood appointments are all having annual health checks by the nurse. So this is clearly taking more time uh, than a, a routine blood appointment, is taking up more of nursing time, and mental health is clearly dominating a lot of these assessments as people are struggling financially, employment-wise, um, and also um, as a result of uh, long periods of isolation. So in conclusion, HIV nurses are pivotal in the ongoing uh, response to COVID by providing essential HIV care during lockdown, by providing triage and risk assessing patients coming into the clinic, being aware of which patients are particularly vulnerable and finding a way for patients with increased needs to have ongoing access to treatment and care and to remain engaged. And finally, by continuing to work in partnerships with colleagues, multidisciplinary team members and other external teams.
So thank you um, to all of my colleagues um, who uh, were involved in uh, developing and changing these services and to the whole of the team who were very much on board with these changes.